Excellent. Welcome. No, no problem at all. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad that you're on. So we'll uh, we'll get started. I can't see your camera yet, but uh, once you turn it on, hopefully we'll uh, uh, we'll see you there. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. As I said, I will be putting you all on uh, mute, and feel free to share something in the chat function or raise a flag if you'd like to ask a question. Very excited, of course, to have you for um, for today's meeting to tackle one of the fundamental issues that we've been talking about throughout the work of the investor network, this idea of how we can advance a community-centered approach in our investment practice and in the enterprise practice in, uh, in general. And uh, many of you have asked, well, this sounds great. How do we do it in practice? And fortunately, we have a great example today coming from Bram and his work with the people's community market with a lot of uh, exciting uh, developments. I'll give a quick intro and then turn it over to Bram. And uh, in advance of that, as we've started doing, I wanted to see if there are any updates from the members that they would like to share with the group. And I, um, you might I can have... chime in. Yeah. Uh, hey, hey, Andrea. Um, yeah, no, I was going to mention um, a, you know, a couple of, of uh, investments that we're seeing that I think kind of uh, signal an interesting, interesting trend or, or something that we're excited about. Um, so some of you uh, may know that um, with I'm with Pi Investments, we invest in um, in impact in the Impact America Fund a couple of years ago, and we were excited about Impact America Fund because they were uh, you know an early stage venture fund investing in businesses that empower um, you know, underserved communities in the U.S. Um, and generally support entrepreneurs that come from those communities as well. Um, and when we were looking at the landscape or domestic uh, venture funds, venture strategies um, in the kind of an impact landscape, Impact America seemed very unique at the time. Um, you know, by and large, we were seeing, uh, you know, most funds were more, most kind of domestic uh, venture funds, impact funds were focused more on kind of the Aloha sustainability lifestyle segment and you know if you go through the impact assets 50 list of, of uh, top impact funds uh, you know the, the domestic uh, venture funds you'll see there generally fall into that category and and we thought that the impact America strategy was fairly unique and kind of really uh, trying to solve you know or support businesses that solve problems for uh, underserved communities in the US uh, now I think what I, my, the app, the update I wanted to share with you was that I think we're we're seeing in the last few months that there are now a number of strategies kind of going down that path, which is exciting. So we just uh, recently committed to uh, another venture fund called Cross Culture Ventures, which uh, has a, a similar emphasis and um, a strong emphasis on democratizing access to uh, healthy lifestyles and uh, again, kind of this emphasis on are the businesses serve, uh, you know, solving problems for, uh, you know, for, di for, for diverse or underserved communities. Um, and I just came back from uh, um, uh, the conference, the Impact Capitalism Conference in Chicago last night and had a, a very interesting conversation with the fund managers that I, that I think also kind of shares very much a, a similar approach, a similar strategy. Uh, another venture fund that we may we may take a, a, a look at. So it's just just exciting to see that um, I think a couple of years ago there was really nobody was kind of carrying that banner, and I think now we're it looks like we there's a there, there, there's a handful of managers uh, marching down that path, and uh, you know, maybe we can we can call it in inclusive venture capital, uh, which is starting to take uh, shape as a as a strategy. Very cool. Thank you, Anair. And yeah, other members, if you if you are interested in the same area, feel free to reach out to Anair. You know how to find him. Um, let's see if there if there was anything else. Anyone else?
if not we can uh, we can get started excellent so um, so yeah let's uh, let's look at this uh, in terms of uh, context setting a little bit uh, on uh, on this idea again of how do we really carry out a community centered approach in a way that uh, uh, that makes sense in a way that uh, truly empowers the, the, the affected community and uh, is not just paying lip service to that. The, we're looking at it in the context of the, the first two transformative finance principles. First, the issue of deep community engagement and second, the non-extractiveness of value that is, uh, that is created within, uh, within those communities. As for the first, uh, uh, one issue that I, that I would like to highlight is that as in some ways um, co-design as a concept has taken more prominence, we've really seen it almost getting hijacked, to, to use a strong term, whereby you, um, or co-opted, let's say, uh, whereby it, it's really one more way of using the knowledge of communities um, in order to, to extract the profit. Right, you might have uh, Colgate Palmolive that says, "Oh yeah, now we have a product that we have tested out with um, uh, with the community where we're trying to sell it, and really it turns out to be not something that is uh, accountable or deeply engaged with those communities, but it's just a way of selling more stuff to people, and that's really not where we were going with this idea of deep community engagement." So. It was in that sense that we went beyond the idea of co-design to also include elements of fair governance going forward so that the, the affected community retains a voice over time in how a project should proceed and how it, its proceeds especially should be allocated. Um, this is especially important if we think of all the challenges that there are within a business and how much stuff changes over time, right? Just having that co-design piece at the beginning doesn't quite get us all the way. Um, and uh, the element of shared ownership as part of that uh, community engagement, being, uh, being thoughtful about which kind of asset building opportunities we are creating in these communities, who gets to be an investor within those communities. And, here we go. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, really, uh, really being thoughtful about having a mandate, right? There is a difference that we've analyzed before between having an outsider coming in and saying, oh, I have this great solution for a community versus having a, an initiative that is born out of the community itself, out of the community's voice around its needs and its, uh, and its aspirations. And uh, similarly, from the standpoint of non-extractiveness, you know, we've looked at it traditionally. Oh, sorry about the bells in the background, but maybe they bring some festive atmosphere. Um, you know, we, we've looked at this idea of where the value is flowing from the perspective of an enterprise, right? Who is uh, creating value, who is capturing value. And I think that the example that uh, Bram is going to share with us today has this interesting focus on the notion of value leakage, right? There is a good that is being traded in a particular community, in this case, uh, uh, in this case, food. And unless there is an option for community ownership, a lot of that value that is being created flows straight out of the community. And um, so looking at it from a neighborhood perspective of non-extractiveness, not just from the enterprise uh, perspective, uh, is, is something that I would uh, look out for as an interesting element for, uh, for the conversation today. Um, so with that, great pleasure to, to introduce uh, Bram Ahmadi to all of you, and many of you might know Bram already. He's definitely a prominent voice in this field, uh, especially in the, in the East Bay and in the Bay Area. He's the founder and CEO of the People's Community Market and um, brings over 10 years of work to where we've gotten today. Right, having started out in, um, in environmental justice work in the Bay Area and uh, really seeing the connection between the environmental justice, the food justice piece and the community engagement overall. So I will turn it over to Bram, very much looking forward to, to his presentation. If you don't mind, uh, hold off on the questions because I think he'll be covering most of, the, um, uh, of what might come up for you. And feel free, meanwhile, to put the questions in the group chat if you don't want to if you don't want to lose them. Thank you for joining us, Bram.
Okay, it's great to be here. Can you guys hear me? Yes, perfectly. Good, good. Well, thank you, Andrea, for setting this up, for inviting me to come on and share a bit about my story and this project. And thank you to all of you for being interested in, and spending a little time with us today to, to learn about what we're doing at People's Community Markets. Um, so just a little background about me. Um, uh, as uh, Andrea said, I, I came to this work, food justice and, and community food projects by way of environmental justice. Um, and, and I've been doing uh, work in, in West Oakland specifically, uh, both in environmental justice and uh, in the community food movement, if you will, for, for about 15 years now. Um, and uh, I'll go to the next slide here. Uh, this is a little bit about West Oakland. If you don't know where West Oakland is, uh, there's a map there that shows you uh, uh, in the sort of um, corner of the East Bay closest to San Francisco. Uh, Low-income neighborhood, predominantly African American and Latino uh, community of 25,000 people, approximately. Uh, and so I started uh, in my sort of early 20s as an environmental justice organizer, working with a number of environmental justice um, organizations, communities for a better environment, uh, people uh, united for uh, better Oakland, uh, Poder, uh, and Green Action. And through that work. Uh, engaged in environmental justice campaigns in both East Oakland and West Oakland, uh, and, and really sort of my entree into building relationships with residents in those neighborhoods and increasingly uh, in West Oakland as, as the, the campaigns focus more there uh, over time, uh, really started to hear a lot of feedback from residents uh, about a parallel set of, of challenges in the community. Uh, so in the environmental justice space, there are, there are a lot of uh, social justice and health inequity issues uh, that affect West Oakland. It actually has the highest rate of childhood asthma in the entire Bay Area. Uh, for those who might be familiar with, with the landscape of, of this geography, West Oakland uh, is pressed up against the Port of Oakland. Uh, and the Port of Oakland brings approximately 10,000 diesel trucks through a day. Uh, so there's substantial uh, air pollution as a result of that. West Oakland is also entirely encompassed by freeways uh, on all sides, uh, which also produces a significant, significant amount of air uh, pollution from vehicle particulates. Um, so those are some of the environmental justice issues. Environmental justice takes an approach where it's really uh, about putting community residents most affected by these challenges at the front of uh, designing a campaign. Uh, setting an agenda, a strategy, uh, what are the demands, what's the ultimate ask or, or solution that's being sought. Uh, and so a lot of community engagement takes place in that process. Uh, and so as, as an organizer, a young organizer working with other young organizers, uh, we would convene a lot of residents and discuss these issues and do uh, charrettes and, and strategy sessions and what have you. And uh, very often and increasingly, residents would mention uh, as I said, a parallel set of issues around not having access to healthy food uh, in their community, not having full service grocery stores, uh, and all the hassle that, that folks had to go through to get to grocery stores, uh, and all of the health issues that they understood to be affecting themselves and their families and their neighbors. Uh, uh, diabetes is particularly prevalent uh, in West Oakland. Uh, of course, these are national problems, uh, public health issues in terms of diet and uh, the overconsumption of processed foods and the underconsumption of fresh foods, but in communities like West Oakland, uh, those statistics are disproportionately high, and and the percentages of the communities are disproportionately affected. So that feedback kept coming up over and over again, and and initially I and some of my co-organizers sort of just parked it to the side, were even a little dismissive of it, uh, and sort of didn't really get it for a while, Bob, because we we were very siloed in this kind of environmental justice space and thought that. Those were the issues that we were working on. Um, but over time, the, the feedback uh, just became stronger and more and more consistent uh, and got to a point where it was really clear that, that community wanted something done uh, and were essentially asking us to take a look at this issue. Uh, and so my evolution to food justice came directly from residents uh, giving, giving me the feedback uh, and, and sort of influencing uh, what I focused on in my own work. Um, so moving specifically to, to this particular problem, uh, as I said, 12, 25,000 residents, about 8,500 families in West Oakland do not have access to a full service grocery store. 
Um, and many of these families rely heavily on walking and on public transportation. As you can see, 39% of the households don't own a vehicle, uh, which means they're very restricted in their mobility and their ability to, to get around and particularly uh, to get to uh, food stores outside of their neighborhood. Uh, there are studies that have also looked at uh, the impact of the cost of transportation on low income families and uh, those studies have determined that between 20 and 30 percent of the annual food budget uh, of those families is actually spent on the transportation costs uh, because they lack their own vehicle or they lack the ability to walk or get to a close uh, a grocery store close to their home uh, so that immediately impacts their spending power for food and it, and it affects uh, where they choose to shop and what they choose to buy um, and so we see a direct correlation between uh, the limited ability to get to a store uh, and the higher uh, the consumption the higher consumption of processed foods in particular um, and there are therefore are a lot of corner stores that that folks uh, depend on about 45 in this particular neighborhood uh, which is a very high ratio it's about one to every 400 people uh, in west oakland these stores tend to be very expensive uh, they tend to carry mostly processed foods uh, and very little fresh food inventory uh, really at all um, so, let's see if I can push this button. There we go. Uh, of course, one of the ironies uh, to this issue is that even though there are no full service grocery stores, residents collectively wield enough spending power to support multiple food markets in this community, about $59 million a year in, in grocery expenditure alone. Uh, and that's not including uh, expenditures for prepared foods or eating at restaurants. Uh, so it's a significant amount of, of spending power that this community has. Uh, and yet, uh, because it's so underserved, uh, about 60% of that expenditure, $35 million uh, a year roughly, leaves the community and goes to stores in other neighborhoods. Uh, and this leakage we see is really impacting the local economy. That's significant loss of spending power. Uh, in a neighborhood that needs uh, investments uh, and needs to circulate its its own uh, uh, capital and spending uh, in its local economy, uh, this loss of capital results in in, a, in about thir in, in about uh, two hundred jobs not being created in West Oakland, uh, which is a significant loss to a neighborhood that has a high rate of unemployment. So there are economic uh, issues that come from this problem uh, as well as health issues. So uh, in, in 2002, after hearing all of this feedback from, from the neighborhood, uh, I and a couple of my co-organizers and colleagues decided to address it. And that ultimately led to co-founding an organization, a nonprofit organization called, called People's Grocery. Uh, and the, the focus of that organization uh, was to develop a mix of small scale food enterprises and, and food projects in urban agriculture and food distribution and education and nutrition education in particular uh, to really begin to address this issue. Um, our first enterprise was uh, the nation's first mobile market. And you can see a picture of it in the upper right hand corner of this slide. Uh, basically took an old postal delivery truck and tricked it out and turned it into a little grocery store on wheels that drove around the neighborhood four days a week on a route and a schedule stopping at central locations. Uh, it was entirely youth run, uh, one adult to drive the truck and supervise the youth. But other than that, it, it created jobs for young people and trained them for many of them, their first job uh, and trained them around healthy food, how to engage with residents and talking about food options, uh, provide them customer service, what have you. Um, other projects that People's Grocery had included uh, a program called the Grub Box. Uh, the bottom left picture there shows an image of that. A uh, a modified uh, uh, community supported agricultural program, uh, uh, essentially the ability for low income residents to uh, purchase uh, produce boxes in advance without having to make the six month subscription that's typically required by most CSAs, uh, which is prohibitive to a, to a lot of uh, residents. Uh, we ran lots of farm stands and we also, as I mentioned, did a lot of educational programming. Uh, so while doing that work uh, at People's Grocery and continuing to engage uh, the community in West Oakland, uh, we heard more feedback. And feedback this time was, 
you know, thank you very much for, for doing this work, uh, addressing the problem as, as, you know, we had identified several years before. Uh, but, you know, these projects are pretty much too small to really uh, service our needs. Uh, they're not really able to be uh, ongoing operations, provide the right kind of scale and efficiency and convenience and pricing. Uh, that residents wanted. Um, so started to really think about that feedback uh, and, and really uh, was also at the same time wanting to find a solution that could sustain itself, uh, that wouldn't require outside funding, that could instead uh, create a viable business model off of the, the known economic spending power and the leakage uh, that I discussed before. Uh, so from that, uh, decided to uh, after going through a strategic planning process in 2009, uh, leave People's Grocery and spearhead the creation of a project uh, to, de to develop a full service community market, now called People's Community Market. Uh, and that, that model would essentially build uh, on People's Grocery, on its experience in running uh, small food enterprises and community projects, as well as its large community network that it had cultivated over, at that point, almost 10 years. Uh, and also utilize the, the insight and the knowledge that we had gathered through those years of doing those projects and engaging residents to develop a highly tailored and targeted food uh, retail business model for this specific community uh, and leverage the community relations uh, that we had built over time uh, to, to really create more resiliency and, and greater likelihood of success to generate more uh, community support and loyalty and patronage of the store uh, that we felt was necessary uh, to create this kind of business model. Uh, and then they take a, a community-centered approach uh, as well um, in how we engage residents in the creation of people's community market uh, and seeing that by doing that, we would uh, likely produce multiple long-term benefits to this business, uh, certainly validating the demand and support uh, that the business has from the community, uh, probably most importantly, engendering the trust and the goodwill uh, and the sense of community ownership uh, in the business uh, from a very practical perspective, ensuring that our products and our services reflect what our customers will really want uh, and, and therefore will see us as their primary shopping uh, a food store in their neighborhood. Uh, increasing the likelihood that we retain our employees as well if those employees are from the community and many residents are engaged with us and supporting our employees in their own success uh, with certain commitments for, for local hiring and, and hiring of entry level workers in particular. Uh, another reason uh, that I think that taking a community-centered approach is, is important is that we have a goal of supporting uh, better health in the neighborhood, both in terms of increasing health, uh, healthier food consumption uh, and supporting healthy lifestyles. And what I found through the years of working at People's Grocery and the engagement and programs there is that people generally make more progress and have greater success in pursuing their health aspirations when they do it together with others uh, and, and in a community context. And so for us, the community building piece is very much tied directly to how is it that we can encourage folks to, to begin to learn about and eventually adopt healthier food choices and make progress towards their desires to, to potentially uh, address a health issue. Uh, so from that uh, came uh, this concept of, of People's Community Market, a small format neighborhood food store uh, and a social hall. And I'll touch on the social hall piece uh, in a little bit that supports families to attain healthier and, and more socially connected lives. Uh, and uh, really believing that increasing access to fresh foods uh, and, and especially uh, whole, whole ingredient foods and less processed and additive foods is the best way that we can support healthier consumption. So it's not necessarily for us about evangelizing uh, organic or uh, products that are identified as natural or gluten-free or some particular health attribute. It's very simply and practically the goal of uh, supporting residents to consume more fresh food. Uh, and if they do that inadvertently, uh, health will, will improve. And there are, are certainly statistics that support that, that idea. Um, 
This is a social enterprise. Uh, our mission is really at the, the forefront of, of what we're trying to do here. Uh, and so we are in the process of, of developing some, some social impact objectives and metrics, uh, sort of in the early stages of still developing that. But you can see here kind of our three primary ones, as I mentioned, uh, supporting health and well-being in the neighborhood uh, by introducing healthy foods and supporting awareness, uh, improving economic outcomes for employees, certainly through job creation and wages and benefits, but also through employee ownership. Uh, we're working with an organization here in Oakland called the National Center for Employee Ownership and are, have worked with them to develop a three-stage uh, plan for uh, converting the business over about 10 years to an employee stock ownership plan. Uh, and really seeing that as an important piece, uh, eventually leading to profit sharing with employees to increase their economic uh, stability and, 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 and conditions. Uh, and then thirdly, fostering uh, community and creating greater social cohesion, again, directly tied to our goals of, of supporting healthier diets and greater fresh food consumption, but also just inspired by the idea that grocery stores, as they used to be, especially uh, decades ago, uh, as real sort of anchors and neighborhoods for convening and gathering and socializing. Uh, and as you can see in, in highlighted in green under each of these objectives are sort of specific goals. Uh, these are 10 year goals uh, that we're working on and, and determining if these are, are feasible and, 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 and how we can implement them. Uh, but we wanna be really explicit about what specific and measurable outcomes uh, we can pursue over time. Uh, so just a, a little bit about the, the specific business model and some of the key uh, strategies here. Um, this uh, store is, is a smaller uh, footprint, it's about 14,000 square feet, which by industry standards would be quite small. It's about half the size of even what would be considered a small supermarket, uh, and it will therefore also carry about half of the, the total inventory. Uh, we see some advantages to this, uh, the main one really being that it reduces the cost of acquisition and development of real estate, uh, which in West Oakland and, and in the Bay Area in general can be very challenging. Uh, real estate prices are very high. It took us quite a long time to penetrate uh, into securing a, a property here in West Oakland uh, due to speculation and, and high prices of real estate uh, and, the, and the simple inability for our performer to carry uh, those high costs. Uh, so the smaller format gets us into a, a, a more viable development scenario. It also gets us into a, a, a more viable location for retail that is highly central to the, to the neighborhood, a high degree of walkability, visibility, and accessibility. Um, the small format also aligns with the, uh, the smaller, uh, what we call transactional or basket size uh, spending of, of residents. So even though on the aggregate, residents spend a lot collectively uh, through the year, the per trip spend is relatively small. And of course, a lot of supermarkets that are geared towards much larger uh, uh, spends per trip, say 75 to even $100 on average per spend or per trip. Uh, have a hard time in, in, in neighborhoods where the average spend is more like uh, 20 to maximum $30. So the smallest uh, footprint can also fit in terms of scaling inventory uh, and therefore reducing inventory management costs, carrying costs. Uh, the smallest store reduces also utilities expense, environmental controls expense, and securities expense, and results in higher revenue per square foot. Uh, in terms of the, the product mix itself, the focus is really on the fresh foods. As I said earlier, we think that's uh, the most practical way that we can support better health is simply by increasing consumption of fresh foods. Uh, fresh foods is also where the biggest demand in the neighborhood is, where the, where the least availability is. Uh, and also industry-wide, fresh foods uh, are really where we're seeing uh, the greatest amount of volume growth in the industry. Uh, we're seeing a greater resilience and long-term potential uh, in the market than say niche offerings like organic or gluten-free uh, and also fresh foods tend to generate greater value for customers and better margins for the retailers. Um, so that's the key focus for us, produce, dairy, uh, quality meats, full service meat and seafood counter, poultry and seafood. Uh, and then in addition to those fresh food elements, a fairly robust prepared foods uh, program as well, service through a cafe with seating, uh, a service delicatessen, uh, and a, and a, a grab-and-go section. Uh, so this is also a neighborhood that, in addition to lacking grocery stores, uh, tends to lack uh, really any kind of uh, eating destination, especially sort of sit-down restaurant, family-oriented uh, eating environment. Uh, and so we see an opportunity there. Uh, and that ties directly to our social hall concept, uh, which I'll touch on now. Uh, so in addition to 
uh, the retail store, uh, we're planning a space, uh, what I call a social hall, uh, called the front porch. Uh, we call it front porch uh, for two reasons. One is it will be at the very front of the store, uh, and customers will see it as they enter the store. Uh, and, and so it's kind of a part of the, the, the frontage and facade of the store. And secondly, uh, front porch is a reference to the, to the old culture, uh, uh, particularly in the African-American community, of gathering on front porches and socializing and, and connecting with, with your neighbors. Uh, so the front porch, about a 1,700 square foot space, uh, will be a programmatic venue, essentially, by day for educational programming, workshops, guest speakers, what have you, uh, and then by evening, essentially converted into a venue for uh, events, activities, live music, uh, poetry nights, movie showings, dinner events. The front porch will be serviced by the cafe, so um, it will have a separate window, or excuse me, a separate entrance from the store. Uh, and that's so that the front porch can remain open after the store has closed and the cafe can continue to service uh, into the evening, extending our, our food sales uh, and, and, and that offering to our residents uh, who are perhaps are coming for a show, can also have a meal while doing that. Uh, on the merchandising side, we're looking at a limited assortment in the grocery category in particular, the package, center of the aisle kind of. A uh, piece of, of, of the usual supermarket format. We are limiting to uh, the sort of top selling items, uh, no more than a couple SKUs in each category, mostly to provide convenience uh, uh, and again to really uh, increase efficiency in managing our inventory and really targeting uh, our turn rates to, to the spending power uh, of this neighborhood. Uh, we're, we're you know very aware of the need to be affordable in our prices. Uh, and so we're looking at a number of strategies uh, to ensure affordability while also generating sufficient margins for this business. One of those strategies is a segmented product marketing uh, program, uh, essentially a, a one segment uh, under what we're calling the value basics label uh, will be an everyday low price basket of, of essential staples and produce, meat and, and, and groceries targeted at value-oriented shoppers, uh, and that segment will account for about 40% of our total SKUs in the store. Uh, second segment, uh, what we're calling the extra choice label, uh, an assortment of specialty products, uh, you know, artisanal, gourmet, organic items um, that are targeted at customers with greater discretionary spending power. Uh, and that segment will represent about 30% of our total uh, SKUs. So by utilizing this segmented program and particularly creating a, a, a label program uh, for an everyday low price mix of products, we ensure that there's a, a sort of foundation or form uh, offering of products that are affordable to lower income customers. Um, uh, on the sourcing side, we're also developing a number of strategies to, to help uh, ensure uh, greater affordability. Uh, certainly direct sourcing, we're seeing a lot of that happening where prices are being re reduced by disintermediation. Uh, we're working with a gentleman named Bill Fujimoto, who uh, has been in the industry for about 40 years, uh, has developed a very extensive network of supplier relationships, uh, and has really proven the concept of direct sourcing is very viable for for fault, uh, excuse me, for small stores that have the flexibility in their purchasing, uh, can conduct a sort of opportunistic buying, spot buying, uh, and be a lot more flexible in their payments to those suppliers. Uh, Bill has also pr uh, proven the concept of surplus purchasing. So in our industry, there's a lot of food waste. About 30% of fr fresh produce never leaves the farm. Uh, and a significant amounts of, of produce that get to stores uh, is never sold to customers. So there's a lot of, of sort of surplus. Uh, and especially here in our region where we're close to a lot of agriculture, we think there's an opportunity to tap into uh, that kind of space, uh, products commonly known as odd lots or seconds or calls, uh, more popularly now referred to as imperfect produce as well. These are products that are typically sold to processors at significantly lower prices. Uh, and so we've begun a process of engaging with these suppliers and, and discussing potential partnerships with them, supplier partnerships to procure uh, these surplus items and showcase them to our customers as uh, being high in flavor high nutritional value, uh, perhaps not being as aesthetically uh, attractive as a, as a you know, grade one item, uh, but uh, being you know, as much as 30, even 40% less in price. Uh, so another important strategy for us. Uh, we're looking at partnering with institutions uh, to increase our purchasing power, certainly as a small store, 
uh, you know, we won't have enough purchasing power to secure the kind of pricings that we would like to really drive down our price points. Uh, so we're in discussion, particularly with the Oakland Unified School District. Uh, they are in the process of establishing uh, a central uh, kitchen and commissary for their entire food service across the school district, just uh, about six blocks away from our grocery site. Uh, so we've started a discussion of partnering with them on co-purchasing as well as using their commissary for some of our food processing. Uh, and by doing that, increasing our purchasing power through leveraging essentially the significant purchasing power of an institutional partner. Uh, we started to talk to a couple other healthcare organizations about the possibility of partnering in that co-purchasing as well. Uh, and then trade partnerships as well. We're talking to Unified Grocers, uh, which is a, a large uh, retail-owned wholesale cooperative here in the Western region as well as uh, IGA, uh, Independent Grocers Alliance, about partnering on their, their private label programs uh, and being able to offer those as sort of dedicated products that are within our everyday low price mix under the value basics label that I discussed earlier. Uh, certainly engagement and particularly providing educational programming and on-site health services is, is something that we want to do. And to do that, we're in the process of, of creating a nonprofit called the Fresh, Fresh Life Foundation. Uh, and this organization will essentially oversee the delivery and coordination of, of on-site educational and service elements in the store. Uh, that's cost effective uh, for the store to not have to carry those expenses on its, on its uh, performa. And also a way of leveraging more community relationships through a, a different organization with a different board that uh, actually has residents directly involved in that. Um, finally, I'll say on the engagement piece, we, we are in the process of, of uh, crafting a membership program to provide uh, savings to our customers and encourage loyalty and, and repeat shopping and word of mouth uh, marketing uh, through that program. Um, th the idea essentially is that uh, this card would be targeted specifically at, at customers who are utilizing CalFresh and SNAP, a supplemental nutritional assistance program, or otherwise known as food stamps. Uh, and uh, by enrolling as members, uh, uh, these individuals will get ongoing discounts on, on produce and select fresh items, as well as rotating discounts on special items. Uh, and they'll also be able to earn points. So throughout the store, in addition to our value basics label, our extra choice label and the segmented marketing program I discussed earlier, there will be labels, uh, what we call shelf talkers that identify healthy products. Uh, and the basic idea there is that when customers purchase products that bear this label, they'll earn points on their, on their member card. Uh, and those points can then be accrued uh, to be redeemed for discounts on those same identified products. So this helps incentivize customers uh, to try and, and eventually adopt healthier foods and, and to make it more affordable for them to do so. Uh, so talking about community-centered approach for us, there are sort of three main ways uh, that we do this. Uh, one is through our Community Advisory Council, uh, which is the most direct way that, that People's Community Market engages uh, residents. And I'll, I'll talk about this in more detail on the next slide. Uh, through community partners, uh, there's a host of organizations within the immediate kind of project area of our site uh, that we're working with. And I'll, there's a slide to discuss that as well. And then thirdly, through our direct public offering, uh, essentially selling stock to, uh, to, to small public investors uh, and building community through that. Also a slide to discuss that as well. So the Community Advisory Council uh, essentially has multiple ways of engaging with us. We created the, the, what we call the CAC uh, about three, three and a half years ago. Uh, initially through People's Grocery, which coordinated it, and then eventually it, it became independent and will now become coordinated by the Fresh Life Foundation, our nonprofit arm, as I mentioned, uh, once that's formed. Uh, so they have multiple roles or jobs. Uh, the, one is to provide feedback and guidance in our planning process. As I mentioned earlier, we really want to make sure that our store reflects what customers truly want. You know, we're not interested in uh, going this alone and sort of uh, designing in a bubble with our own assumptions. Uh, and putting our own values at the front. It's really important that uh, our value proposition, our product mix, our store environment, the customer experience, uh, everything reflects uh, what residents desire uh, that creates a uh, inviting uh, space for them and, and one that they see as very relevant to their own lives and their own values. Uh, so, so the Community Advisory Council is very important in helping ground that process. 
Uh, they conduct outreach for us. They organize events for us. We're currently co-organizing an event for June 18th, uh, what we're calling a community celebration event to celebrate uh, the milestone of, of securing our location uh, in West Oakland. Um, they assist in community relations. They assist in, in leadership development. Uh, there's a slide in a moment to talk about some of the challenges uh, engaging uh, with uh, community-centered process uh, and leadership development is an important piece of, of addressing some of those challenges. Uh, they advocate with local government. Uh, so some of our community advisory council members have gone and met with city council members uh, and other leadership in the administration in, in the Oakland city. Uh, to discuss our project, to advocate for greater city support. Uh, they've also spoken with media on our behalf uh, to really ground our story and validate the, the degree to which community residents are actually involved in what we're doing. Uh, and they help hold us accountable. Um, so this is voluntary for us. There's obviously no legal or even structural uh, reason in terms of our bylaws at this stage uh, where we would uh, have to engage community. But we believe it's not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. It aligns our values for social justice uh, and our ideas that uh, the, this business can be more successful and more resilient uh, by engaging community and doing so in a very authentic way that gives residents a direct conduit to us and, 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 and ensures that uh, we, we stick with our mission and we stick with our focus of, of, of engendering equity and food access in this community. Uh, just briefly, uh, and to demonstrate the degree to which the, the residents are involved in this, this is a chart showing the composition of the Community Advisory Council. So currently it's a 15-member group. Uh, this chart and this, this composition structure was created entirely by the CAC members themselves. Uh, we did not suggest to them that they should think about composition, but they felt that it was really important uh, to make sure that the mix of, of residents that are on this board are are both uh, diverse and, and representative of the community, but also uh, are grounded in the sort of historical makeup of the neighborhood. So as you can see, starting with 15, it very quickly splits out uh, to 13 West Oakland uh, and to non from the 13, eight being residents, five being uh, individuals who work or worship uh, in West Oakland. And the worship part is a particularly important piece. There are a lot of churches in West Oakland, uh, particularly Black Baptist churches, uh, but many of them have seen their congregations leave, uh, going to other areas uh, in, the, in the East Bay, but typically coming back to worship at the church uh, because their family has perhaps been going to that church for several generations. Uh, so we felt that that was important to be inclusive of those individuals who perhaps are not technically residents anymore, but are still very much tied to the West Oakland community. And then from the eight residents, uh, this group wanted to make sure that a certain mix of them, six of them in this case, are, are relatively long-term residents and then allowing for two seats for people who are relatively new residents and coming in. Uh, and all of this partly has to do with concerns and, and fears and pressures of gentrification and, and displacement and, and very fast change in the neighborhood. So the Community Advisory Council wanted to be uh, pretty intentional early on uh, in terms of, of how this uh, this body is configured and, and and how the, uh, the process of participation and inclusion takes place. Uh, so in terms of community partners, a, a second way uh, that we, we uh, do community-centered work, uh, as you can see, this is uh, on the left, a map of our, our trade area, if you will, uh, with half a mile uh, concentric circles. Uh, we see uh, the initial half mile as a sort of core project area, uh, half mile from the site, uh, and so this is three specific neighborhoods, the McClymans neighborhood, the Hoover Foster neighborhood, and the Clawson neighborhood. Uh, you can see the census tracts there that correlate with those neighborhoods, about 9,000 residents within that immediate half mile. It's about a five minute walk from our store. And again, with about 40% of residents not owning a vehicle, uh, we felt that a highly walkable uh, location uh, and consideration of that uh, was really important to this concept. Uh, the project area also includes uh, the San Pablo Avenue corridor, uh, which is a major traffic corridor through uh, the, the upper northeast of West Oakland. <coughs> Excuse me, about 8,000 residents living along that corridor uh, within this trade area and about 13,000 vehicles. Uh, and within that immediate project area, the half a mile, uh, a, a high concentration of affordable housing, about 24% uh, affordable housing of, of the total units. 
uh, in that area. That includes an, a number of fairly large uh, senior facilities. So St. Andrew's Manor, uh, uh, which is uh, across the street on one side from our project site and Sylvester Rut Rutledge Manor uh, on the other side of the street are both high density senior uh, housing developments uh, for, for low income residents. Uh, and then the California Hotel, uh, which is owned and operated by the East Bayesian Local Development Corporation, is just about six blocks to the north, uh, is also a, a density affordable housing complex that provides a lot of on-ground services. Uh, and then in this immediate area, there are a lot of partners, and these partners are an important conduit for us to a wider network of residents. Uh, they're important allies in helping move our project forward to help us address key challenges and barriers to developing this startup venture uh, and to mitigating the risks and increasing the resiliency of the business uh, through this kind of program where we really extend beyond sort of industry partners and really go deeply in with community partners and organizations. Uh, so there's a list there uh, of, of many of them that are both immediate within the area and that we've worked with uh, I'll point out two in particular that we've worked with in particular, uh, the East Asian Local Development Corporation, as I mentioned. Uh, we started working with them about two years ago now uh, to acquire our site. So we were getting hammered essentially in the marketplace on our own. Uh, we'd gone through, I think, three different negotiations for properties unsuccessfully and then approached Evaldi, their acronym, uh, and knowing that they're you know, now a 40-year-old community development corporation with significant expertise and capacity in real estate acquisition development what have you uh that uh, they could be a good partner in helping us solve that problem and, and get control of a site uh and 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 that uh, was very critical in our success for for ultimately securing this location not only in terms of a coming on as a partner to help uh do outreach uh, to site owners negotiate uh and put together our financing strategy what have you uh, but ultimately a ended up becoming the landlord, uh, and they didn't send, set out to do that. Uh, but through a securitous path where uh, we brought an angel investor to the table who understood our challenge of not being able to secure institutional financing for an acquisition of real estate in a, in a highly inflated real estate market, uh, a gentleman essentially offered himself to be a source of patient capital and bridge capital, uh, but stipulated that to do that, uh, he would require a more established partner to come in uh, as the lendee uh, and, and to do the acquisition. Uh, and so Abaltzi essentially saw the opportunity and the need and stepped up and took on that role and subsequently took a note of $970,000 from the angel investor, purchased the property and is now our landlord, uh, providing us with three years of free rent uh, and being a highly aligned landlord, uh, really getting what we're about uh, and giving us the stability and the breathing room, if you will, in terms of our occupancy costs to to really get a strong runway for this business. The other one I'll, I'll highlight is the San Pablo Area of Revitalization Collaborative, or SPARC, uh, also really focused on this immediate half mile area of our site. Um, it's a challenging area. There are, there are a lot of social, socioeconomic challenges. Uh, this neighborhood has not uh, had seen any real positive development. Uh, in, in decades, our business will be the first larger business to come into the entire San Pablo corridor in West Oakland uh, in, in many decades. Uh, and so there's a hope with, with Spark and some of these other community partners, the West Oakland neighbors being the neighborhood association, uh, that PCM can act as a real anchor and a catalyst to uh, uh, drive more community development and create synergy with other smaller businesses. Uh, that might be willing to come in after we've sort of anchored uh, that specific area. Uh, so touching on the challenges of community partnership, um, uh, it can be a really slow process. Uh, you know, we on the, the management team and board of PCM want to move quickly as possible. Uh, we've set out certain milestones by when, you know, we uh, secure permits, by when we break ground, uh, financing, all of this. Uh, so we feel a certain timeline and sense of urgency, uh, and yet at the same time, we really value and prior prioritize uh, community being authentically uh, involved uh, and in a very central way. Uh, and so that means uh, for us a significant trade-off sometimes uh, in how quickly uh, our, our work moves forward uh, with how deeply involved residents are 
Um, you know, there are cultural sensibilities about time. There are simply socioeconomic realities of individuals who are involved in terms of their very limited capacity and time to be involved uh, because they uh, may be working full time, may have multiple jobs, may be single parents, whatever the challenge is. So there's a degree of sensitivity that we have to bring to it, but certainly uh, time can be a challenge when working with community. Uh, skill sets uh, can, can be a challenge as well, especially as we get into a little bit more technical aspects of talking about performers and other sort of business concepts. Uh, working with residents that don't entirely understand sort of fundamental assumptions behind creating a viable business model uh, can can create challenges in navigating perhaps differences of opinion. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, the Community Advisory Council is an important way that uh, leadership development happens uh, and, and there is some education uh, of our members uh, in really understanding some of these basic ideas. Uh, and then thirdly, and kind of related uh, to the first one around residents' limited capacity uh, to be involved, and especially at an accelerated rate, we've learned that uh, there is an absolute need for some kind of a support structure for resident engagement. Uh, we've, we've learned uh, unsuccessfully that a purely voluntary and self-driven process by residents uh, it is not particularly effective. Uh, it's not about them not wanting to, it's more about them not having the capacity to. Uh, so we have to staff um, the process, provide at least some kind of a coordination role, a support staff role uh, that helps convene, uh, organize, convene, set agendas, facilitate meetings, take notes, do follow up, all those kinds of things. Uh, that all has to be handled by someone that uh, has the financial support uh, and, and ability to put the time into it. Otherwise, those processes don't happen or, or don't happen very well. Uh, so that adds costs to the process of community engagement. These are costs that tend to lie outside of the essential startup costs for creating this kind of business. Uh, so we have to get creative, uh, both in terms of uh, where that funding comes from and in what conduit it passes through to be able to support that community engagement. Uh, it comes up a lot in terms of uh, creating a replicable model. Um, it's not necessarily something that we are explicitly setting out to do. Uh, but it's something we're aware of. Certainly, if we're successful, if we prototype a concept and prove it, um, then uh, there, there is an opportunity potentially to replicate this model and not necessarily uh, under a people's community market sort of brand or chain, but simply a business model that other communities could learn from, uh, could adopt, and could adapt to their own. Uh, I think that uh, one of the big questions about whether or not our model is replicable is the amount of investment and time that goes into building community relationships well in advance of launching uh, this kind of business. So, you know, we've put in now almost 15 years of engagement in West Oakland. I wouldn't expect most projects to necessarily put that much time uh, into their own work. Um, uh, but nonetheless, what we're seeing is that is a critical asset for us, uh, probably one of our greatest uh, advantages uh, and, and assets as a startup business. Excuse me a second. Okay, so moving on. Um, the DPO, uh, the direct public offering. Uh, so for those who are not familiar with it, simply the ability for, for any business, uh, but more commonly small businesses, to raise capital from their customers and from their communities. There are a variety of different ways that can be done. In our case, we, we, we chose to sell stock, to sell preferred shares uh, to, to California uh, residents. Um, the reasons for doing this, uh, first of all, we tried to raise capital in other ways. And of course, this was uh, three and a half, almost four years ago. Uh, I went on about a nine month sort of pitch circuit, pitching our concept and, and found that uh, there was not really alignment uh, because of uh, how early stage our company was. Um, uh, how few milestones we had yet accomplished at that time versus even what we've accomplished now. Uh, and therefore, uh, impact investors, uh, foundations, managing PRIs, what have you, uh, not really seeing that we were yet at a place uh, where we were ready to do any kind of investment or transaction with them or be suitable. Uh, so we had to figure out another way. And uh, we work with a firm called Cutting Edge Capital here in Oakland. I'm sure some of you on here are familiar with them. Uh, and they advise us that the direct public offering, essentially a, 
uh, a, a means of crowdfunding a securities offering was a good alignment because of the way that People's Grocery and People's Community Market had built significant visibility and relationships, uh, a fan base, if you will, of, of supporters throughout the Bay Area, uh, that there would be an opportunity uh, to potentially raise a first tranche of capital through a direct public offering. So we decided to do that. Um, and we saw uh, some real advantages, one being that we could attract highly aligned investors or what we call shareholders, uh, really focusing on the, the mission, the vision, the mission, and the social impact that this project is trying to have. Uh, you know, this is not a very financially competitive offering. Uh, we'll get to what the terms are in a moment. Uh, so for us, uh, what was important was to accentuate uh, the attractiveness to the mission and the alignment with investors who care about this issue and want to see sustainable solutions and community-based solutions for it. Um, another one was being in inclusive. Uh, and we'll get to a few slides that show the mix of our current shareholders, uh, but really being, being able to go beyond the limitations of private placements uh, and uh, exclusivity of accredited investors being uh, eligible to invest, but really sort of throwing open the gates and allowing uh, anyone, in this case, who is a California resident, uh, to be able to make an investment and become a shareholder. And, and, and so, as Jenny Casson from C Cutting Edge Capital talks about really democratizing uh, the investment space through these kinds of uh, community-based and crowdfunded models. Uh, for us as a business, uh, resolving the barrier specifically to working capital, we found that that is the most difficult part for our business, and we're hearing other startup businesses as well. Uh, versus perhaps uh, the loans and other debt financings that might come in uh, for construction uh, and other capital expenditures that can be collateralized. Working capital is, is very difficult to collateralize and often therefore difficult to secure. Um, capitalizing through small investments, similarly to the democratization, allowing everybody in, uh, aggregating lots of small investments to be able to raise a, a, a very, fairly significant amount of money for us. Uh, aligning uh, the terms and the cost of capital uh, of the investment with the mission uh, and, and with the performer of the business because of that mission. So where we uh, may be less uh, 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 profitable or, or not perform as strongly in margins because we are uh, marking down prices, because we are paying higher in wages and other benefits to employees, because we are investing in programmatic supports to our customers, uh, that performer, we believe, uh, therefore needs aligned capital that supports it through through better terms uh, and in terms of maximize the focus on the mission uh, and then also terms that don't require an exit uh, our goal is to retain local ownership in west oakland to be a long-term business that is community based and community owned and employee owned uh, and and also again to not precipitate an exit event for investors by changing our business model and our performance in such a way that our mission would be perhaps secondary to other operating decisions to maximize efficiencies and profitability that would pre precipitate that exit in the future. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we did go on a pitch circuit for, for quite a while, uh, about nine months in 2011 and 2012. Uh, we looked at uh, impact investment, we looked at PRIs, we looked at grants, uh, we looked at uh, subordinated debt. Uh, we spent a lot of time in that space. And now that we're coming full circle, and I'll touch on our accomplishments uh, in a few slides from here, uh, those are now potential sources of financing that are more viable, or rather that we are more viable for uh, than we were previously. Uh, and that's been a real success to this direct public offering model, uh, is that it has helped substantiate our business, validate uh, the public support for it, and put it, put it you know, uh, a notable amount of capital in our balance sheet uh, that, that therefore makes us uh, a more viable business for other potential investors. Uh, these are the terms uh, of the direct public offering. Uh, you're welcome to go to our website, peoplescommunitymarket.com. Uh, there's uh, much more detail there. Our offering memorandum is there. Uh, all of the investment documents are available on the website. The entire investment process can also be done on the website as well. Um, and so essentially, uh, this is a, 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 an offering of a million shares at $2 per share. The goal is to raise $2 million, of which we've raised just short of $1.3 million so far. Um, we've set two minimum investments, a $1,000 minimum investment for unaccredited investors and a $5,000 minimum investment for accredited. 
Uh, and certainly, uh, we would certainly welcome more investment beyond the minimum, and, and we have gotten that from quite a few, which I'll mention in a moment. Uh, it's based on a 3% interest rate, essentially, paid as a dividend. Uh, those are accumulated over a seven-year period. Uh, the redemption event or the payback comes at the end of the seventh year of operations of the business, uh, seven years from when we open our doors. Uh, these are non-voting, non-convertible shares. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, the direct public offering is an interstate offering. At least in our case, uh, we are only uh, approved by the state of California. Therefore, this is limited to California residents and entities that are headquartered in the state of California. So just a few Brian, slides. Please, Andrea, um, can I ask you quickly uh, on that previous slide uh, on the terms, uh, how do you pick those terms? Is there is there such a thing as market terms for a DPO deal? Or is this something that you figured out with your advisors? There are no market terms. Essentially, every business uh, that conducts a direct public offering uh, can craft its own terms, uh, as well as the, the, the vehicle for investment. So as I said earlier, we chose to sell stock. Uh, we felt that that was uh, easy and marketable, uh, sort of messaging uh, to the public. But I know other DPOs that are uh, that are doing different kinds of equity placements or revenue shares uh, or even a, a more straightforward debt instruments. In our case, it, it is like a debt instrument. Uh, it's, it's structured like a note in term, as far as the terms go. It's a fixed term and a fixed rate, uh, even though the mechanics are purchasing shares in terms of our balance sheet. Uh, we felt, again, how to communicate to the public uh, this investment that appealing to something that they were familiar with, something like a bond or a simple CD where they, they know what the time period is and they know what kind of rate they're, they're, they're earning on that uh, was the easiest way to market this, especially to unsophisticated investors or average folks in the public, as I like to call them, who've never done any kind of direct investing like this before. Um, so we designed these uh, internally uh, with some advisement and some engagement externally, but for the most part, simply uh, setting up our own benchmarks in terms of what was the minimum amount of capital that we needed to raise through this tranche uh, to to create a viable performance balance sheet. Uh, and therefore, that's how we set the minimum uh, in terms of the timeline and the rate of pay on the interest rate. That was all developed through our operating model and sort of projecting what we could viably offer, both in terms of time and interest rate, uh, while knowing that there will be a capital stack uh, and also knowing that there are certain constraints on our margins because of our commitments to, to the mission in terms of pricing and, and wages and things like that. Uh, thanks, that was very helpful. And I see there is a question from Bruce Campbell from uh, Blue Dot, one of the members of the network, uh, on given the interest in inclusivity and democratization, why make the preferred stock non-voting? Uh, we made it non-voting because we felt two things. One, that the majority of these uh, shareholders are, are not intimately involved in this business uh, and do not have really enough information uh, to be able to. And for us to be able to provide that information is not very feasible. As you can see from this slide, we currently have 413 uh, shareholders. Uh, and that number will continue to grow as we move towards our $2 million uh, goal. And so for us to be able to uh, educate our shareholders and provide them with the level of information necessary for them to be able to vote in a knowledgeable way uh, didn't feel practical. Uh, secondly, our goal is to become an employee-owned business. Uh, the common stock, uh, which is not what's being offered through this DPO, is being preserved for our employees and for our management. Those are the voting shares. And so we're essentially trying to set the stage and, and create the structure by which uh, the operational decision making uh, is in the hands of, of our employees and our management team. Uh, thirdly, I guess uh, for us, we felt that with such small investments, uh, that voting was not really commensurate to that level of investment. It's, it's, it's difficult to manage this process. I think the, the biggest downside to the direct public offering is the degree of relationship management that's involved when you're aggregating small investments from a lot of people. Uh, and, and uh, you know, handling the communications and the information requests uh, and, and all of that with them uh, is a lot. And so for us, we felt that we wanted to minimize that. Being a startup, having a lot of other challenges and issues to attend to, 
uh, on our plate uh, that sort of at this stage anyway, creating a more robust uh, shareholder voting process and educational process was really kind of beyond our capacity and, and what felt realistic for us to do. Uh, so just going back really quickly to the slide, currently 413 shareholders, and as you can see, the overwhelming percentage of them, 84%, are unaccredited investors. Uh, so this is truly a sort of small investor campaign. Uh, that's validated by this second slide, which shows investors by the amounts that they invested. So over 50% uh, of our 413 investors invested at that minimum of $1,000. Uh, if you add in the, the next slice of the pie, uh, the 1,500 to 2,500, you see that 75% of our, our total shareholders invested $2,500 or less. So relatively small amounts coming from the majority of these investors. Uh, having said that though, with this slide, when we break it down by the amounts of capital invested uh, by these different investors, so the percentage who invested 1,000 versus the percentage who invested uh, 50,000, or excuse me, not the percentage, but the do total dollars coming from those different investment amounts. Uh, the $50,000 and, and the $25,000 amounts uh, were certainly meaningful in getting us to where we are today. And, and somewhat equal in terms of total dollars coming in. These are investors by location. So in, in addition to being focused on small investors, uh, we're really focused on local, not just the state of California, but really the Bay Area and especially Oakland in particular. Uh, and if you see any of our marketing materials, uh, which I'll, I'll show you one at the end of this deck, uh, you'll see that we really focused on Oakland and a message around a more thriving uh, Oakland and appealing to the pride and love for the city. Uh, so 47% of our shareholders are Oakland residents. Um, I will say that within that mix, however, only about 10% of our shareholders are actually West Oakland residents. Uh, and that goes back to the minimum. So we set that $1,000 minimum for unaccredited investors feeling that that was the minimum amount that we could set it at with the assumption of how many people we thought would actually invest in this thing. Uh, and, and so we had to set that minimum and we did so knowing that that was gonna leave uh, still quite a few people out. Um, now we are in the process of launching a program. We've partnered with a foundation who's given us an initial $25,000 grant to launch a program that we're calling the Shareholder Assistance Program. Uh, and that essentially is a grant that we will use to uh, subsidize lower income residents of West Oakland who cannot afford the $1,000 investment to become shareholders. Uh, so if they can only put up a couple hundred bucks, 500 bucks, even $100 uh, through this shareholder assistance program and the funds that uh, we've received, uh, we'll be able to fill the gap and get them to that $1,000 investment. Uh, so they'll become shareholders like the rest of, of our 413. Uh, the upside for them, of course, is that in the long term, when the re redemption event comes around at the end of the seventh year of operations, they will receive the full $1,000 repayment plus the uh, dividend uh, interest rates on top of that. Uh, we're working with the Community Advisory Council to develop the shareholder assistance program. So they're currently creating a matrix of different tiers of investment and the uh, requirements to qualify. They're also developing an application that is uh, more simplified than our than our uh, subscription agreement on our website, which you know is heavy in, heavy in legal language and what have you. Uh, and and so here we are with what we've accomplished to date. Uh, as I mentioned, we've raised almost 1.3 million dollars from the direct public offering. We also did secure the 970 thousand uh, dollars from the angel investor for the real estate that then passed through to a Baltsy, uh, and we formed a long term lease with a Baltsy. Uh, and then we were also able to secure a property next door uh, with an organization called St. Matthew Missionary Baptist Church. And they were listed on the partner list in the earlier slide. Uh, a 60-year-old Black Baptist Church founded in 1955 uh, that has been a strong uh, anchor institution in West Oakland for a really long time. Uh, so we're, we formed a long-term lease with them for their parking lot, uh, which uh, significantly increases our parking capacity which is both a requirement for a permitting process as well as uh, our desire to increase our trade area uh, by offering that parking convenience. Uh, but we're also partnering with St. Matthew. St. Matthew has uh, become actively involved in our community advisory council. They are co-organizing this community celebration event that we're uh, going to be holding on June 18th. 
Uh, they're also going to be our primary food donation recipient. So St. Matthew has its own uh, food pantry and, and food giveaway programs, uh, and, and we're partnering with them uh, to, to donate uh, surplus foods that, that we'll be giving, uh, as any grocery store does. Um, and this is a significant opportunity for St. Matthew. Uh, even though it's an anchor institution in the, church, in the community as a church, it has been in decline. Uh, for quite some time. Uh, its congregation has been shrinking as residents leave. Uh, the remaining congregation is aging out. The majority of them are, are, are uh, senior population. Uh, so they've needed an infusion of energy and a, and a means of revitalizing themselves. And uh, already just in the few months of, of, of partnering with us, uh, they've really started to get much more active. Uh, we'll also be improving their property as well, uh, completely regrading, repaving, restriping. Their parking lot, bringing in new fencing and gates, lighting fixtures, security cameras, and taking on the landscaping and the maintenance responsibilities for the parking, uh, all of which will improve the, the church's facilities and, and, and what have you. Uh, we've assembled uh, you know, our board, our board of advisors, our, our management team with veterans uh, from the industry with decades of experience in food and grocery retail and food service and finance and in business management. Uh, and we've secured term sheets. Uh, uh, for up to $6 million uh, in, in financing, I mean, construction and mini perm loans. Uh, these come from the Self-Help Federal Credit Union, the Northern California Community Loan Firm, uh, and uh, social, impact, uh, social Impact Partners, no, Capital Impact Partners uh, as well. Um, so they're all very motivated as CDFIs. Uh, they all have funds uh, that they have received, mostly through federal sources, directly tied to fresh food and food access projects. Uh, their problem is they're not finding a lot of shovel-ready projects, especially uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, and so uh, all three of these uh, lenders are very interested in partnering with us and being a, a source of financing for the project. Uh, so I'll say from here, what's left for us to do, obviously, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our goal is to get the $2 million uh, in total capital coming in from a direct public offering. Uh, and so we'll be launching a match campaign shortly. Uh, something that we've done uh, several times in the past. For example, we partnered with uh, RSF Social Finance here in the Bay Area to conduct a match campaign, uh, and uh, several groups of investors have gotten together and pooled their investments. Uh, essentially, a play out of the nonprofit kind of fundraising world where we offer a match for a limited period of time, uh, whereby this larger investor, for example, RSF, would put in $50,000 in investments uh, if we were able to raise equal or greater amounts of that within a two to three week period of time. Uh, so we have another foundation that has provided a $50,000 investment commitment uh, to be used as a match. Uh, we'll be launching that probably later uh, or maybe mid-May um, to drive uh, investment. What we find is another challenge, as I'm sure you're all familiar with in fundraising you've done, is not generating interest uh, in, in participating in our direct public offering, but actually converting people and getting them to kind of go through the actual transaction process. Uh, you know, just the reality of, of people being busy, procrastination, whatever it is. So we found that creating these incentives, things like matches, uh, can really help uh, get people going, feel a sense of opportunity and urgency to that investment. Uh, so our goal is to raise $2 million uh, by October of this year, or to reach the full $2 million uh, uh, capitalization. Uh, to secure our permits by September or October of this year uh, and to close on our financing within roughly that same period of time. So all sort of coming together late third quarter, early fourth quarter of this year. Uh, if all those key pieces can come together, uh, then we will be able to break ground uh, by the end of the year or by early first quarter of 2017. We're looking at roughly an eight month construction project. Uh, and so if we are able to begin in the early part of the first quarter of next year, uh, that means opening uh, in the late or part of the third quarter or early part of the fourth quarter of next year. Ideally, a nice little lead before the holiday season of 2017 to train our people and get our system solid before we get a significant rush of holiday shopping at our store uh, and, and tie our grand opening kind of themes with the holiday season. Uh, so those are kind of the key milestones uh, that we're working on now. We've got a great team put together in addition to our board and our management team. We have a project development team. Uh, Ebalti is our community development partner. Uh, we have an architectural firm, a project management firm. Uh, we're just in the process of making the final selection of our general contractor. 
Uh, we're working with Unified Grocers as our merchandise planner uh, and our interior uh, store planner as well. Uh, so all our pieces are coming together and we're building our momentum now that we've reached this key milestone in securing our site, which was only about six weeks ago. Excellent. Congratulations. And thank you so much, Bram, for this presentation. Um, I want to make sure that we leave time for questions. So I will take folks off of mute. Uh, and uh, so feel free to chime in. Feel free to put the questions through the chat box if you prefer. But you should now, by and large, be able to, to ask your questions. I guess this is Bruce, I guess, with a, a question over the microphone, which is if you were offered, if you were offered a $2 million investment on sort of typical DC terms, which would probably involve more control, um, and assuming that a venture capital investor would accept a return like this, would you, would you be willing to trade the kind of increased control and influence of a, a venture capital investor um, for the facility of raising the money? In other words, would you, would you rather have $2 million and then have it maybe potentially faster um, but with more control that that money has? Or would you, do you think you would, again, choose this process of a longer process of uh, the DPO with a, with a number of shareholders that, that don't have control? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think that, uh, you know, what I'm seeing as our, as our business strategy evolves is that local ownership is really important uh, and also our ability to really keep our mission at the center of our planning and our business. Uh, and, and, you know, this may be more fear than reality, but my, my fear is that uh, going that secondary path with uh, a, a private investor that may have more control and influence could somehow undermine our ability to really maximize the focus on the mission of the business. Uh, for me, that's everything. I'm, I'm not doing this uh, for any other reason other than to really create positive good and, and, and social impact in the community. Um, I could do other things to make far more money than this project, as could just about anybody else. Um, so this is very explicitly a social enterprise that is seeking to take on a, a host of, of social challenges and solve a market problem. Uh, but not in a purely market-based way. Obviously, there are ways that subsidy come in, comes into this. And one of those is the kinds of terms of capital uh, that comes into this, the patient capital, the terms of that capital as well. Um, so I think to answer your question, at least now, perhaps because I'm feeling more emboldened uh, by the success we've had and, and the amount of money we've raised and the momentum that we have in that, I would probably choose to take the time. Uh, and retain more control and ownership of the business so that we can make sure to keep the mission really central to what we're doing. There are going to be decisions that we will make about that mission uh, that will in some ways uh, undermine the, the maximum efficiency of the operating model. Uh, they may not be the most practical or prudent from a pure business management perspective, but in terms of maximizing impact, in terms of maximizing uh, community involvement and social capital, uh, th those would be the right decisions to make. And, and I've not yet had an opportunity anyway to sit down with a private investor that would really align with that kind of approach. If they're out there, I'd love to meet them. I'd love to talk. And, and, and you know, I think that uh, I'd be open to changing my mind. But thus far, you know, that's, that's my bias. Um, another question from me, Bram, is Andrea. Uh, to, your, uh, to your point that you just made to, uh, in response to Bruce's question, is there a way in which some of these aspects could be 
easily implemented you know, within a more commercial enterprise. I mean, I'm fully with you that the way uh, people's community market is structured is very much social at the core. But is there a way in which we can borrow some of it in, uh, in cases where there might be a, a more commercial approach? Well, I, I certainly think that, uh, you know, our approach to using the Community Advisory Council uh, to our community partners, beyond trade partners and commercial partners, uh, those are absolutely elements that I think just about any commercial business could undertake if they're willing to make the investment of, of time and cost to do that. Um, and I also think that certainly direct public offerings, uh, whether or not they are the best choice for raising capital, can be a very good choice for increasing social capital and increasing the level of community participation and public involvement uh, in a project, all of which I think would be positive benefits to, to any business that chose that kind of an approach, even if it's for a small tranche of capital. The symbolic value of that and the, the level of participation that comes in, I think, could be really important. Um, yeah, I know some grocers around the country that have a sort of community relations component to what they do. Uh, some even have a staff person. Uh, that does that as part of their marketing budget. Uh, I think the difference here is the, the, the level of depth uh, that, we're, that we've gone with this and that we plan to continue to go with this kind of exceeds what seems to be of interest for most co commercial enterprises that I've seen anyway uh, in terms of the amount of investment that they're willing to make. Uh, I would certainly make the case that the long-term upside to making that investment is, is compelling and real. Uh, but I've not yet seen a commercial enterprise that wants to go quite as deep as we have gone uh, to, to build the relationships and, and sort of put community-centered processes um, uh, at the center of, of, of their business. Uh, because there are also some certain ways that management and leadership of a company uh, would have to be very sensitive to uh, how they're authentic about listening to community input. Uh, I think what would be bad to happen is if you had a, a community engagement process, uh, at least the auspicious of one, uh, but then it ends up looking like, at least from the community's perspective, that management didn't really listen to what the community wanted. If, if management feels that they have certain uh, elements that they need to retain control of, then there's probably gonna be a limit to the degree to which uh, the community can really be given the reins, so to speak, in any kind of planning or design of that business. Wonderful, thank you, Bram. Let's see one last chance for questions before we close it. Let me take people off mute. Start putting folks back on mute in this case. So thank you, thank you so much, Bram. Is there any? Sorry, I think I got muted too. Is there anything, Bram, that you wanted to share with us in closing? Uh, well, I mean, like I said, we are we are still raising capital uh, through our direct public offering. If if you're a resident of California or you work with a, a firm that is headquartered here and you're interested, uh, please do go to our website, check it out. All of our information about our direct public offering, our securities offering is there. Uh, and I'm more than happy to speak with anyone who wants to have a more detailed conversation as well. Otherwise, I, I thank you all for your time and listening to, to my story. Cool. Thank you very much. And uh, here is um, uh, Bram's contact information. You'll find everything at peoplescommunitymarket.com. Uh, his email is bram at peoplescommunitymarket.com. And if you have any feedback in general about this idea of how to implement a community-centered approach uh, of the sort that uh, the Bram has uh, has, sort of, uh, has uh, explained for us, uh, we would love to hear from you as we start gathering more examples of best practices in this area. So uh, please do get in touch if uh, if you have a similarly exciting opportunity or uh, past instance to share with us. 
Thank you so much, Bram. Thank you, everyone, for participating. And good luck to the People's Community Market with all the tremendous work that you're doing. Thanks, Andrea. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much all for right. attending. Bye-bye.